uh, talk about this code. So here we have main. Main calls square root. Square root calls uh, the absolute value function. And what's notable here is that um, uh, there, there happens to be a variable called d here in main, and there happens to be another variable called d, which is a parameter in square root. We call this variable, what sort of, or what sort of variable is this? It's called a what variable in C or C++ or Java? It's called a local variable. This, on the other hand, is a formal parameter um, uh, within, within square root, and this calls apps. Okay? Um, great. So the flow of control here, I think, is familiar to everyone. So we have, oh, this is method call, it should say function call, main call square root, and ultimately returns to main, and of course there's a call to abs in here as well. Um, I should have uh, shown. And so um, a key component of all of this is the ability to kind of remember where to come back, to where to come back. So how is it, for example, that square root knows to come back to main? Um, and uh, we, we implement that discipline through something called the call stack. Have a way of keeping track of where we were. And uh, we were in the middle of something, now we're going to go do something else. We want to be able to come back to what we were in the middle of, right? Um, and that includes coming back to kind of where in this particular function we were, like right here. So we come back to this place. But it also re includes remembering kind of what the values of the variables were, right? We want to remember, like, after we call square, we want to come back and Okay, no, okay, where do I go for variable d, et cetera, right? So the call stack is what we use to perform this function. It's the, it's the mechanism we use to sort of remember where to, come to where to come back and remember um, what the, the values of uh, associated variables are, okay? And method variables in Java or, or local variables in, in parameters within C live on this call stack. That's that's their world, and when the call stack is, uh, when the call, the activation record, the, call, the frame and the call stack disappears, they disappear from existence, okay? So when one method calls one another or one function calls one another, we place a new element on this call stack, okay? Now, why is it important you need to know about the call stack? Well, it's important for several reasons. One of the reasons is it helps you understand um, the meaning of certain statements in, in C in a very visceral sort of way. What exactly is going on there? And that meaning will carry over to Java, will carry over to C++, will carry over to uh, many other additional languages like Scala and Ruby, etc. Okay, so that's one reason. A second reason is that um, you will want to know about this call stack for pointers. If you really want to know what's going on with pointers, you want to you wanna be able to reason about this call stack. Uh, okay, like this whole return of P, why that's nonsense. A third reason is you will encounter error messages that involve this sort of uh, situation. So if you're working in Eclipse or if you're working in GDB, you'll encounter error messages. A fourth reason is that um, in GDB, you can explicitly ask to see the call stack. So that trace back full type of thing, you will see the call stack. So what is this call stack? Uh, here we have main calling square root, calling abs. This is, this is actually the call graph. So we say main has within it a call to square root, right? And square root has within a call to, to the abs function. Great, okay. Um, now, when we actually go and call these things at runtime, when it's actually called one call the other, this is what happens. Um, we have a call to main. And there's certain information within main that's passed on there. I have elided, I have eliminated certain information that's low-level details, which I don't think you really folks really have to worry about, except to realize that it's one of the big reasons C for one crack, um, because you corrupt that information. But um, main up here, uh, you'll notice main has in it arg C, arg V, and a double D, right? And those are all allocated on the call stack. They live on the call stack, okay? Um, and actually, they should be in, if I'm really being careful about it, they should be in a somewhat different order. Arg C should be lower than arg V. And it, yes, it actually matters for certain contexts like printf, which are variable numbers of parameters. Um, okay, so, so arg C is pushed on first, arg V is B. What do I mean that they're pushed 
gone. Well, what I mean is the value for RMC lives here. There's a value. There's a particular number for RMC, the count of arguments. Maybe it's three. Okay? Um, we have three arguments passed to this main, to this, to this uh, program. RV lives there. What do I mean by RV lives there? Well, what I mean is there's uh, a sequence of, of pointers in RV that point to some locations, and those pointers are stored here in the call set. D lives here. The value for D can be found at this location. It's, it, it's, it's a particular value at a particular location, just like R and C is. So there's a number here, there's a series of numbers here representing pointers, and there's a, there's a number for D. They live there. You went you looked at memory, you'd see them laid out in memory just like that. Okay? Now, main calls square root. Calls off to square root, and it's passing it some values. It's passing it, well, as it's, oh, yes, it's passing it this value for D as the second argument of square root, and something else is the first argument of square root. Great. Okay. Um, so here we've pushed on, and again, this... Uh, should have actually been in the reverse order. The second, the first argument gets pushed first and the second argument later, so we should have had this. Um, uh, okay. Um, tolerance in, in, the, in this line should actually be, should be pointing to this D down here. Okay, so, so here we have the value for D with respect to square root, and we have the value for tolerance these are two variables. Their values uh, are found here. So D within the square root, D refers to the value that lives here. It refers to that location. And the value at that location is the value of D. Tolerance refers to this location and has a particular value that's located there. Okay? That's, that's great. And then square root calls abs, the abs function, and maybe it has an argument called value. It has a formal parameter called value. Um, now, the first thing I want to emphasize here, folks, is that D here doesn't care or need to know about D here. There's no, there's no interference between the two in any sense of the word. This D and this D are, are solitudes. They, they don't care about each other. It's a total accent. They have the same name. It doesn't matter. There's no interference because of that. Let me bring that back to the actual code here. There's no interference between this D and this D. They could have totally different names, and it would not one whit change how the program operates. Inside of the code for square root, D refers to this D, refers to the location associated with that D. And inside the code domain, D refers to a location associated with its D. And when I refer to those locations inside main, it's this location inside square root of that, le that location. Okay, so there's no interference there. Are people comfortable with that? Okay, that's the first thing. You could name them whatever you wanted, no interference at all. It's just, what is that? It's just a question of what is that, what, with what location is that name associated for a given function? And here, if they're either local variables, like D is for main, or if they are formal parameter names, like that is for square root, the D there, they're referring to some location on the set. Great. Great. So D inside of square root refers to this D, D inside of main refers to that D. Okay. Um, this is just a location where a value lives. Here it's a floating point value, here it's a, it has to be, um, it's also a floating point value. Okay, great. Um, so we have this stack. Now, within this stack, um, suppose we had a situation where, um, and I'll illustrate it with this. Suppose we had a situation where we um, assigned here to a value. So if we assigned um, a, a tolerance to be equal to 0, Point zero. What is that assigning here? How, what is that changing? Suppose we did that. Suppose, suppose we assigned within square root tolerance to be zero at the end of that function. What would it be changing? Yes. Um, uh, 
I, my computer is recording it from afar. Um, um, now I can I can put on my microphone and. Oh, no, I was just wondering if we could on the microphone. Yeah, I, I I appreciate that. I um, the first lecture I ever gave was a lecture held in an engineering building where the floors were consisted of two to three feet of concrete because they had to support large uh, large machinery in the early years and. Uh, I, I gave my lecture, my first lecture, and I went downstairs to some to an office where I worked, and they told me, "Oh, we really liked your lecture." And I said, "What do you mean you liked it? I didn't sit there." They said, "No, we didn't. We didn't come, um, but we heard you through the floor." Um, and I said, "No, no way." And they said, "Yes, every word." I said it was a good lecture too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, if I can penetrate the concrete, um, it's my hope that in my uh, my older age, that I'll still be able to communicate uh, across the room, but uh, just in case, I will have this uh, this uh, this recorder on. Um, one other time, I was giving a, I was doing consulting in Singapore, and I gave a, a, a lecture to a small group, and I was later told that everyone across the entire floor of the building heard my intention. <laughs> and it wasn't my intention, but uh, hopefully, my computer will hear it. Um, so good, good call though, um, and I apologize if I, if I um, sound too loud with this. Uh, okay, so um, uh, one issue that I noticed these 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 in no way interfere. Suppose that we at the end of square root were to uh, assign tolerance to be zero. What would happen there? So, ladies and gentlemen, we assign tolerance to be zero. What changes? Okay. So the value associated with this location changes to be zero, right? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, does it affect at all the value of D? Because wasn't that passed as the second value here? It should definitely not affect it. This, this in fact, is the formal parameter, but it's just the value. When you call square root, ladies and gentlemen, what happens is, Whatever the value of D was here, it gets put into this, this place on the stack, whatever the value of, of, of you know, the, the first argument gets put there, the second argument gets put there. It's just a value. Just a value. And tolerance is the name of that value. So if you assign tolerance to be zero, all it does is it changes the value associated with this location labeled tolerance. And that's it. There's no other, there's no other change that's going on. It does not in, the, in any way modify this value down here, um, which was source, the value D, which was the source of, of tolerance. So it so happened that we said, you know, square root and we passed it D. But all this is saying, what this D is saying is use the value of D. The value of D right now, use that as the second argument. And what that will mean is it will take that value faithfully and it will put it here and it will take some other value and put it for this place. From then on, any assigns to tolerance are just occurring and they're changing that value. It was a copy of the value of D. It was not, in no way, you know, is sort of putting the identity of D in there. It's not saying that tolerance is the same as D in, in main. Instead, it's just saying, Hey, take this value that happens right now to be in this variable d and treat it as the second value, the second argument of a square root. So in other words, take a, a copy of its value and use it as the, the initial value for that tolerance variable. So if you had this assignment to tolerance, the effect of that assignment, ladies and gentlemen, is limited to square root not affecting anything outside of square root, square root function. It is certainly not affecting this. Are, do people understand that? This is an extremely important point. Now, the reason this came up, the sort of immediate reason this came up was because, I um, should have been more careful with the chalk. Chalk is a precious commodity in here. Um, this is my biggest larder here. Um, so there was a question uh, that people had asked about uh, one of the assignments questions where, you know, I think it had, um, 
it, there, there was a uh, request, you know, dialic vect or something like that, and uh, and it has some pointer, you know, a vector star p or vector star v or what have you, vector star um, p, and then so it's a pointer, and then you know there was this idea that at the end you might assign this to be null. That doesn't change anything outside of this. It, it sure it sets the value of p to be null in case there was code later. That's fine. But uh, if this is the last thing that goes on within this routine, within this function, nothing else is going to change. Nothing else outside is going to change. Um, so, you know, you may have said when you called this, you may have said dialic vec and called it with some some value v. You know that's that's associated with the location B, but you could then go on and use B here willy nilly, and it wouldn't. It, it hasn't been assigned to zero to null. Is that? Do people understand that? People want more explanation of that. So just like assigning tolerance to zero here doesn't affect the value of you know this variable D that was the source of the value of tolerance originally. Assigning you know, P to be null here in no way affects this, this value of B. What happened is when we said the alloc vector B, the value of V was copied, at some pointer, it was copied and given to P. Just like here, when we called square root, the value of V was copied and given to tolerance. And from then on, any assignment to tolerance just just uh, throbs this value here, the value of tolerance that lives in square It doesn't touch the original source of that value, which after all could better build this in computation. Yeah. But can't you actually affect things in the input after the address or something yes. like that? Yes. And I was going to comment on that. If you want to actually affect D here, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to affect D, if you want it here in square root, well, it wouldn't be square root anymore, but if if, if you had some function, if a function foo, do I have a foo over here? <sighs> Thing of beauty. Um, okay, so uh, if we have here foo, and we have another function bar, and we want bar to actually so maybe foo has some int n, right? And maybe a, I don't know, calls off to some to compute it. And then we're going to call bar with n. Um, and suppose then bar takes an int n, int n in, and it assigns, or sorry, oh, we'll call it something else to be clear. And we, we assign a, you know, a to be 3. Does this change the value of n here? No, not in any, remember, the copy of that value is taken here and given to A. A is referring to a different location than N, right? People come through with that. Okay, so suppose we did want bar to be able to modify N, how would we do it? We could pass it, the address of N, we then take bar taking a pointer to an integer, and then we could assign to star a equals 3. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, would affect that, because we're, we're taking, okay, this is a, some pointer to an int, right? The value of that is copied and given to a, and, and now we could assign to that. So what would that look like in terms of the stack frame here? So now foo is calling off to bar, and what's what's going on here? Foo has this n, right? It's just a label for this location which has a value, right? It's a value three, or something like that, right? Okay, now we call off the bar. Here we are we are passing the address of n as the value of a. So a here is going to point to n. So if we assign star a, it overwrites this. Are people comfortable with that? Okay. So there's nothing.
nothing inherently bad about that. It's pointing to this, just like you could point to an array. And if we say star a equals 3, we can sign it. That's all hunky dory. That's being, you can do that and still be meticulous. Where it gets dangerous would be if, if this guy too were to return a pointer to one of its variables, for example, to n um, after it returns. Imagine if, if you know, this guy returned something was pointed into here, then it's not something. So this thing's going away. It's going to disappear. When far returns, this is wiped out, and we're back to foo. And maybe foo will then call bass, right? And it'll do some stuff, and then it will return. Maybe foo will call zap, and it will do some stuff, and it will return. That's, that's all fine and good. The, the point is that you can pass a pointer sort of up the stack, a pointer to something lower. Passing back a pointer to something higher is nonsensical, because that higher level of the stack, the deeper level of the stack will disappear when it returns. So it's dangerous. Yeah? No, it would be undetected. It wouldn't detect it. You would, you would be doing things that are nonsensical, and it would give you not one indication at all, not one wit. Um, so, sorry? Well, it would be, uh, I mean, you, you could make it, <laughs> I, I mean, you could make it be controlled gibberish, um, but, uh, but, yeah, okay, so let's examine the case of that. Let's just make this very concrete. I, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm, I'm frightening people. Um, this is my big fear. I'm afraid I'm frightening people. But maybe a bit of fright, sometimes a bit of fright can be useful, but in this case, I think maybe maybe it's not so good. But um, OK, so fine. So now we're going to have a different situation where foo is going to again call bar, and bad things are going to be done. Um, OK, uh, so bad things are going to bad things are going to happen. Bar, so foo is going to call bar. And what is bar going to do? It's going to return an insert. It's going to return a pointer to an integer. What's that? That means something. Right? Yeah, yeah. OK, so, so what would be fine is, imagine if in star bar, it did, uh, it you know created a, a pointer to an inch. Are you folks comfortable with palette? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I take back my words. Uh, okay, so if we add a new, so you're comfortable with this syntax? C++? Yeah. Okay. You should be. It's, it's nothing really evil. Um, <laughs> and, and at some point, I kind of break you into it, because um, 332 might. Um, okay. Um, so. Uh, we're gonna perhaps. In fact, I'll even do malloc, which is even more um, more basic. Um, so we're gonna do a memory allocation of how much, how many bytes. Well, it's gonna. We're gonna have ten integers. So the total number of bytes in is ten times the size of an int. Okay. Okay. Twenty. So if an int is two bytes, this would be ten times two. Uh, it'll be 10 inches. Yeah, we'll yeah. 10 inches. Okay. And then I could return P, right? Uh, return P. So I've allocated some memory, and I can return it, and I can use it in, in foo. Is that okay? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. So, so I'm going to say, sorry, um, I should be clear here. I'm going to have an int star P equals bar. Okay? So it's going to call up the bar. Bar is going to allocate this memory. Now someone later is going to have to clean up for it, but fair enough. And it's going to return P. So when I call bar, it, it returns this pointer. It's taking, taking this pointer, storing it in a place called P. 
storing it in a place in its activation record. So, so here's the activation record for, for foo down here, and here's the activation record for bar. So here's foo, and here's bar, and we're going to have this thing p here. So we're allocating this memory. So when foo calls bar, p is going to get allocated using malloc. Okay, great. And we're going to return p, uh, a pointer to p. So p up here, p up here is going to point off to some place. Ah, it's pointing off to where? To, an, uh, to an in, a set of 10 integers. But where do they live, ladies and gentlemen? I mean, you got a better dog than that, but it's, like, it's pointing off to a set of 10 10 integers. Um, so these are 10 integers. And where do they live? Do they live on the stack? No, they live in the heap. They live in the heap, it's called. Okay? This is place out there with things that are allocated by malloc or new. Th those live in the heap. That's called the heap. Now, why it's called the heap is a historical thing, but it's called the heap. Okay? Um, so this does not live in the stack. That's very important. And now bar returns this value. So this value inside of p, that's a location called p. And there's a value inside of it, which is a pointer to this thing. And when it returns, you know, I, I have p here, but they don't interfere in any way. When it returns, value of p here is going to now, it's returning this value. It's going to take a copy of whatever the address of this is and put it into p here, because we have p equals bar. And this guy is going to disappear. Does that cause problems at all? No, there's no problem. This guy now points into the heap. Great. Great. No problem. OK, now, now we're cooking with gas. And this guy here, he can assign through p to be whatever. He could, he could assign to, you know, the, to the you know, fifth element of of p equals some some value ten or whatever, no problem, no problem. That's great, that's great. P is pointing to this place off in the heap, no problem at all. Is that okay? You bet it's okay. Okay, now where does it get into bad situation, ladies and gentlemen? Where is it bad news? Where is it bad news? Well, I'm gonna go over here and draw a case where it's bad news, and I wish this light were working. Um, okay. So where it's bad news is we again have foo, and foo again is going to have an in star p. It looks a lot like the previous thing, in star p, and in star p is going to equal bar, the, re the return value from bar, just like over there. Foo is identical to over there, right? Um, and it could go do do things with, with p. Great. Do whatever. Great. No problem there. Foo is, is in order. Bar, what is it doing? It also, just like over there, it's going to return an int star. It all looks good. It all looks like we're still cooking with gas. Looks like we're playing with a full deck, but we're not. We're going to be in bad shape. Okay, so here's bar. It returns an, a pointer to an integer. Great. Okay. And, and what is it going to do? It's going to do this, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. It's an integer. Is this fine? Yeah, no problem. And now, ladies and gentlemen, oh, don't do it. i got to show this to you. I'm sorry. It returns the address of M. Oh, it's horrible. It looks so innocent. <laughs> it looks so clean. But it's disastrous, folks. What's going on here? Well, let's run this thing. Okay, this is just a specification. Let's, let's go run it. Okay, so we start with foo. Here's foo. And what lives in its stack frame? Well, there's other stuff that I'm not showing you, like its return value and so on. But the basic things I want to come across is there's got, they've, they've got P, just like it is over there. It's got a P. Right? It's got a place P that's initially uninitialized. Um, well, okay, just until bar returns. It's, it's waiting for a value to be put into it. It's uninitialized. It doesn't yet have a value in it. 
there, there's, there's a bits in that, there's something there, but it's not yet got meaning in it. Ladies and gentlemen, until you put something in a location, it's, it's got something in there, and that's one of the dangers of C. You can look at that something and think it's meaningful, and it ain't. Okay, foo calls bar. What happens here? Okay, who calls bar? Mm. Just like over there. What lives in bar stack frame? Good. N lives in bar stack frame. Great. Great. N lives there. So this whole thing is going to return. And what's going to happen when it returns? Maybe I'll just just so it's a little bit clearer to you, maybe I'll make this a, a multi-step process. I'll just draw out the the action in more detail. I'll, oh gosh, it's like watching a high-speed train train wreck in, in slow motion or something. Um, so we so we have in star p equals. Oh, look at that. It's, it's even worse when it's in bad handwriting. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> So we'll have int n equals 3, okay? And then we'll have int star, I'm going to call it p, I could call it q, it doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to say that's, this is an ampersand. I never knew how to draw that right. In a, I still don't know how to draw it right. I probably will die not knowing how to draw it right. Um, okay. So this is int n equals 3 in bar, int star p equals n, and then return p. So now we have a p up here, we have an n up here, and what does p point to? Point, points to n, that's what that ampersand n means, right? Is that okay so far, is this okay? At this place, is this okay? It's fine, the world is still sane. And it just takes one more step, and this is the power in the hideousness of C all in one. Takes one more step. Now we return this pointer. So P holds a pointer to N. We return P, so it takes a copy of that pointer. Again, I want to emphasize, it takes a copy. Just like when you pass the value, it takes a copy of that value. That's why D became polymer. It took a copy of, of the value of D in that first thing, and it became the value of tolerance here. We're returning a value. It takes a copy of this pointer. So this copy of this pointer, and it gives it, and it's going to return it to P. Now, this is what results. And if that should give you pause, it's with good reason. So what is this pointing to, this P? Yes, yes. It's pointing to the place where P was, but no longer. It's pointing to the place of the farm that burned up. Um, it is it is pointing to something which doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so this is dangerous because there ain't no there there. There's if we write to this, we don't know what what's there now. We don't know what will be there. We don't know if it's going to be preserved in any way. Suppose we wrote to p, suppose we wrote here star p equals 5. What's going to happen? It's going to write 5 there. Until else yeah, until foo calls something else. Maybe it calls out. And then this thing just gets overwritten. It gets blown away. It gets changed because there's a function call. And imagine you sitting there trying to debug your program with bleary eyes. And suddenly the value of this variable changes out from underneath you for no obvious reason. You didn't assign to it at all. All that happened is you made a function call to a function that doesn't modify anything. It, it called printf and it destroyed your variable. You call printf and your variable goes from being, you know, the value of this thing goes from being 3 to being 5. So from 5 to being 2,429. Um, because you call printf. Would that be disconcerting? Yeah, it'll be disconcerting. Because printf, you read printf's definition, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that at all. 
So why, how can it be modifying things? How can it be modifying the star P? Because I'm pointing to the stack, and the stack goes, it goes, it, it waxes and wanes. It, it, it rolls out, and, and you can have a pointer to things on the stack in, in C. And it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. You can pass things up the stack, or, you know, you can pass things to deeper, deeper functions from things that are lower on the stack. So foo could, we saw it over here, right? This very first example here. Um, foo could pass something to one of its variables to bar, no problem. Um, the, uh, the thing there is, right? So foo is here, and bar is here. And we're passing, so there's n here, and it's passing in to, to the value for a. So we're taking, taking a pointer to n and take a copy of it and giving it to a here. That's perfectly fine, right? Who called bar? Because this guy is going to disappear before this guy does. Does that make sense? Whereas over here, it doesn't make sense because you know the thing that's being passed disappears before the thing to which it's passing that that pointer. Bar the, the activation record for bar disappears before the activation record for foo. Here it's okay because we're pointing to something in the heap. It's not on the stack, and we can decide when to get rid of this, and so we can keep it. Now. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we're sloppy. Sometimes we deallocate this, and we forget there's still a pointer to it. And that's called again a dangling pointer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a case of a dangling pointer. This far one over here. This case where we return a pointer to something which is now gone. That was a dangling pointer reference. It's now a dangling pointer reference, and it can it can lead to bad things. Okay. Um. So. We, for example, might have originally, maybe we think P is a char star. Maybe we think it's a pointer to a, to a string, and we're going to go look for the end of the string. And we, again, we search forever. We go, or not forever. We search, 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 and we don't find it for a long period of time until we're outside the area allocated to the program. Okay. So, within a Linux based system, you'll have you know, the stack growing. Down, it's shown in the opposite direction. What I'm showing, and the heap grows in the other direction, and one hopes never they twain shall meet, um, that they'll they'll stay uh, separate here. Um, uh, so broadly, there's storage allocation done in three different places. One is the stack. We've seen that for calls. Another place is dynamic for heap, and a third place is stuff that just is like global variables. Global variables. So if you have a global variable, it's an int. Or a global variable, it's an array. Or maybe it's a giant buffer. You know, ten, a million characters. And it lives, you know, it's it just lives uh, outside of either of these functions. So I have this, you know, giant, uh, a giant array of, um, you know, it's like my string buffer or something like that. Um, or I'll call it uh, I'll call it buffer. Um, apologies to the chemists. Uh, and you know it's a blank, the million. So this is a giant thing that's allocated out here. It's not living in the heap. It's not living on the stack. It's not inside a function. It's not living in the heap. We haven't allocated it and deallocated it. We don't need to. It's automatically allocated for us. It's 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 allocated. Um, it's just the space for it is reserved. It's static data. It doesn't come and go during the program. It's just allocated for the entire program, the length of it, and it disappears when the program exits. Does that make sense to people? So this is this is some data. That's a big amount of memory, and it's sitting there, and it's not beholden to any one function. And it doesn't depend on us to calic it or malloc it. It doesn't depend on us to do a new on it, and we don't have to free it. It exists for the lifetime of the program, and it disappears thereafter. Does that make sense? OK. OK. So here's our storage allocation. Stack and heap. And then there's some static 
area, and we sometimes hear this called uh, a BSS, um, maybe binary static storage. I can't remember the uh, the acronym. Um, uh, and and then there's some stuff associated with the code. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. That one bad thing that can happen with um, that that can happen with pointers that are loose, they can get into they can get into the code here, so they can start pointing to code. <laughs> so, so there's a whole class of people out there, ladies and gentlemen, that want pointers to point into your code. Who are those people? Sorry. Because they want to treat your code as data. Because they want to change your code. <laughs> they want to change it to, to do something favorable to them, or at least to, so that they think they can strut their stuff. So, so they want a pointer into your code. And so loose pointers are their friends. Um, pointers that are at the end of buffers that that can be pushed, you know, into to extra space. So that they're, they're looking for ways to sort of exploit C's vulnerabilities to turn an integer pointer into a character pointer, for example. They want to exploit that so that they can get the pointers to point into areas of your code. So they'll try to allocate a huge array, a giant array, ladies and gentlemen, for example, uh, hoping that it may allow them to put something in a sack, for example, um, or or they might do something that will allow them to take a pointer and sort of point down here and try to modify your code. Try to sort of, because your code, the, the program that you've written, these things get turned into numbers. They get turned into numbers and locations as well. It's just normally we have a convention, we don't change those locations. That's called self-modifying code. And it's not considered a good thing. There are. There's, yeah. there's uh, functions uh, that are known as deep check functions, which you could use to ask like what things are currently allocated in the heap, to, to walk the heap to find out what things are allocated there, how much memory has been allocated. So there are libraries that allow you to do that. Um, and I think, in fact, one of my slides, maybe it was last lecture or the lecture before, may have mentioned such a library uh, at one point. but. Um, the fact is, in fact, there's a broad set of, um, of tools now that are available to allow you to do that. They, they do require, um, uh, they do require some comfort with the idea that, you know, in the heap there's many different things living and some things get deallocated. You can ask for a consistency check to make sure the heap's okay, that it's not something weird hasn't happened. I wish we didn't have to tell you these things. <laughs> Not in second year. I mean, maybe fourth year. So when you're feeling more ready for it. But it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, so, so you know, bad things can happen here. Like, at, b before this heap, secretly, before before this first place, there's, uh, in most heap allocation algorithms I'm familiar with, there's a secret bit of storage where it keeps track of how long this is. So it says like this is 20 bytes long or something like that. Okay. And what can happen is that this can get blown away and it can turn into negative one or zero or, or what have you. Um, or it could say a value that is obviously incorrect because the next item in the heap is right after it and and it knows that and and it, maybe it has a, a sometimes it may have a, a sort of a forward pointer to the next item in the heap and this is obviously in any case, um, the heap can get corrupt in obvious ways, and it can go find those sort of so telltale signs, like where this is a negative value or something, and say like, hey, you know, bad things have happened. So you can actually call routines, and there's, for C programmers, there's been quite a, a set of libraries that have been built up to ease that. Um, if you go look up heap check, for example, online, it will, it will give you comments for that. You can also look up um, things that, that report basic statistics on the, on the 
it takes care of allocating the premium for you. And it doesn't let you do funny business by passing pointers to things on the heat, on the stack and stuff like that. Okay. You're kept out of trouble by restricting your freedom sum. And frankly, I think it's a good it's a it's a good trade-off for most most needs. Um, so the um, the thing with, with garbage collection is that there may be a bunch of things in the heap that are allocated, okay? Um, and you'd really like to know maybe some of them are character arrays, some are, are integer arrays, you know, some are structures of some sort, and Java is some class, whatever, right? C plus plus, so the classes. Um, the deal with garbage collection is we'd like it to automatically know which of these can be freed up. And to do that, it needs to, traditionally, it needs to know, is there anything else that points to this, okay? Because if there's something that points to it anywhere, um, then I, I can't safely free it up because someone may use that pointer later. They may try to do something like write to that or read from it, and that would be undefined if I clean this up, right? So garbage collection tries to avoid, it, it cleans things up that no longer are things pointing to it. Now, this can get complicated because it's not just variables that can point to it. It's other data structures. So you can have an array of, of pointers that points to this, right? Um, you can also have self-referencing data structures. One points to the other, <coughs> something like that. Um, and, and yet nothing externally points to them. And so when it comes to garbage collection, you have to you have to be really rigorous in sort of defining, okay, what you can clean up and determining that, okay? But garbage collection is something that is a, if people have worked on it for decades and they have very good algorithms now for doing it. Um, to do it in C automatically is just not feasible. And why? It's because maybe this thing that looks to us like an int is secretly elsewhere in the program treated like a pointer. Maybe we do something like you say, oh, this is an int here, and treat as an int, and then later we turn around and say, hey, hey, cast this, cast this in to a Charstar. <laughs> <laughs> cast it. Oh. And, and, <laughs> and C says, you got it. Um, you, want, you, want, you want it as a Charstar? Here you go. And, and, you know, it sells it to you as a Charstar, and then, and then, then you know you could you could you know point it to it. And so the problem is in C because we don't really know the true meaning of things, because they may not have a a completely well let's put it this way, there's no way we know what the true meaning is besides running the program. We can't look at it and just say, I know what that is, because it's it's all smoke and mirrors sometimes. It's you really know, loads it in from disk and treats it as a bunch of bins and, or treats a bunch of characters, but it's really over here in this part of the program it treats as a bunch of doubles, right? Um, these things these things go on. And um, uh, oh, don't, don't get uh, <laughs> so Bill Gates was famous for doing certain certain things like uh, this really, really uh, clever sort of uh, clever use of space saving mechanisms where you overlap instructions. Um, so like that first half of, the second half of the instruction would sometimes be used by a different path. Um, and and it, would, it would take advantage of the fact some instructions are two bytes, but you could interpret the other, the second byte as its own instruction if you just jump to that directly. Um, so it'd be like interpreting halfway through an integer or something like that. And well, you wonder why things crash sometimes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but Bill, yeah, Bill was, um, I think at one point they used like a lookup for a sign table as instructions or something like that. It was, it was just like wacko, wacko stuff to save space because they were really space constrained and, and they wanted to conserve space at whatever cost so it could run within the, the limited memory available. But you, you end up twisting things in unhealthy ways sometimes. Um, so, uh, so garbage collection is not feasible in a C-like language because you don't truly know what things are because it's, it can be smoke and mirrors and it can be loosey goosey and you just you just don't know how this is going to be truly treated. So you have to be very conservative. And ladies and gentlemen, this is an important lesson. I want you to have this lesson. It, it's one that people often miss, particularly those not trained in computer science. Okay, people, a lot of people out there make the mistake of thinking the language.
language like C because it's close to the metal, it's going to be faster. Okay? And it's true that it's easy to write a C program that's wicked fast, a simple C program compared to a simple program in Java. Because it's, it's executing using the full power of the processor, you're not going through a, a, a Java virtual machine and so on. But it turns out that that's been getting, the Java's been getting more and more capable over time. The hotspot compilers years and years ago started getting towards there, and it's been getting better, but it's still got a lot of stuff going on with extra pointer allocations and so on. You can avoid and see. But, and this is the point, the more subtle point that's often missed, you spend such a huge amount of time debugging things in C. And it has to play such a conservative game, because it doesn't really know how you're going to, you really want to treat this thing, that it can't perform certain s tricks to speed it up that it otherwise would be able to play. It just has to say, look, I'm not going to touch that because I don't know what in the world you're doing there. <laughs> you just take care of it and I'm not going to try to speed you up, okay? If you're doing that, it's up to you to make it fast. That's what the Z compiler does. It's sort of, it's up to you. It's all on your shoulder. A language like Java, a language like Scala, a language like Erlang, a language like Lisp, you actually can spend a lot more time refining the algorithms. You don't spend as much time you know, debugging loose pointers, dealing with memory leaks, trying to fix these Heisen bugs that sometimes appear. They, when you run the program normally, they appear, and when you run it on your debugger, they disappear. And if you don't believe there are things like that, um, so, uh, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of things you spend your time on with C that if you're working with higher level languages, you can spend that time making, using more intelligent algorithms, like algorithms that run faster because they're designed more cleverly, the algorithm, not just like the coding of it. And moreover, you can often have the language itself figure out much more intelligently, oh, this could be put on another another core. This, this code can be sped up in this clever way, because I know that this is an int. An int is an int, and it's an int. It's not going to be weirdly treated as a double, you know, by the next routine over. So, I can speed that up. I know how ints behave, and I know that I can clean this up. I can free up this memory for you, and, you know, keep it, your program more spelt, keep it more sort of streamlined, and so on. So, so people make the mistake of thinking that C, you know, C is is where it's at in terms of speed and so on. The truth is, if you're building a big program, you're often going to save a huge amount of time and therefore be able to put that time into real intelligent ways of making it faster that will still keep it flexible, still mean that you don't have to spend huge amounts of time debugging but at the same time make it much faster than maybe your first cut C version would. So what, what might have taken you six months with C might take you a month with the right with Scala. And you can put those other five months into adding extra features or making it the core algorithms rip snorting fast, you know, because they're cleverly designed. They're really they're they go from well you folks aren't gonna come to this for a while, but they go from an O of n squared algorithm, where if n is is uh, a thousand, this takes about <coughs> approximately a million uh, a million time units to something that's O of n log n. So in other words, where you're something that takes three thousand time units, you can create algorithms that go from this to this. It just takes time and it takes thinking, and it's easier to do in a high level language. So, see, it has its places. If you're doing low-level coding for the Magellan spacecraft or you're doing something like that, if you really need it to run in a very, very tight memory footprint, um, it has its place. Maybe for the core routines of an operating system, maybe. But increasingly these days, we can do things better in a higher level way. Okay. Um, there's a lot of C code that has to be maintained. So. And so we got to teach you these things. So be careful and don't think you're going to have to spend your life doing it. Increasingly, we can do better speed-wise, memory footprint-wise, and so maybe in some cases, yeah. And um, and in terms of uh, 
ease of extending our system in another way. Okay, so question, yeah. Eisenberg, I think that's Yeah, there, there's a lot of people Yeah, so, so it has been adopted into some aspects of popular culture. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Heisenbugs are, um, are a well-known uh, phenomenon. Um, and these are bugs that disappear when you go and try to investigate them. They, when you try to observe them, they, they change. Um, and often they change in a way they disappear. Um, and these are compared sometimes to boar bugs, B-O-H-R, as in Niels Bohr, um, which, uh, which are bugs that um, may be confusing and so on, but they're reproducible. They're, they're more clearly defined. Here, Heisenbugs will disappear under investigation often. So I dealt with, I don't know, maybe uh, true Heisenbugs, maybe 10 of them in my time as a C programmer. You know, like every every couple of years or something, um, on average. But uh, but maybe when I was doing professional C development, about once a year and and or twice a year. And these things were um, uh, Heisenbugs. Uh, you know, were often uh, most clear because you would the bug would disappear if you tried to simplify the situation. <laughs> so if you tried to reproduce it under simpler conditions, it would go away. Or most notably, you tried to run it in a debugger like GDB. Would just go away, and and uh, yeah, that's. I think the worst of them, though. I mean, I don't want to give you the impression that like you cannot find these. Things. I remember the worst one took me, I think, maybe three days to straight like pursue. And I was like, <laughs> after it, three days, I got it, I got it. Um, but it could take a long time, and doing that, spending all that time just because you forgot to free a thing of memory or. Or you freed it up and you shouldn't have because it was later referenced by here. Oh man, um, it's you know, the better place to spend your time. Um, okay, other questions though. <coughs> questions. Um, I have more slides. <laughs> you, want, you want you want more slides? Um, okay, well we saw saw that. Um, right. So memory, memory. It's an array of, of bytes. This is how it's viewed from systems perspective. It can be accessed using different widths. So, so we could say these first four bytes are two two-word integers. So one integer, for example, um, uh, for these first two bytes, one integer for the second two bytes. We could we could say that. Um, we interpret them as integers. Um, uh, alternatively. Um, we could we could imagine these first four as a single 32-bit floating point number. Single number, floating point. 3.1415926. Um, uh, we in C we can treat it at different times using different things by casting it. It's not recommended, but but we can say, okay, now we're going to treat it as a float star, now we're going to treat it as a, as a char star, okay? Um, okay, so, um, you know, we can, we can often sort of view it in different ways and in different circumstances. Generally speaking, it's dangerous to have too many ways of, of interpreting it, and often it can be represented in just one way. Okay, so what's in these memory locations? So we have these locations, these bins. What's in there? Well, it's funny. And those bits can be some data, part of this number approximation of pi. It could be a program instruction to tell add these two values. Um, it could be the address of memory location, in other words, it could contain a pointer. Or it could be undefined. We haven't put anything in there. It has some values, we just haven't done anything with it. Okay. Um, so what happens when you create a value, a local variable? Um, you reserve memory locations for the use of that variable. So this is a long, for example, and it reserves four bytes. Okay. And it associates some logical name or the block of memory. For the most part, it doesn't care about the name when it's run. The name is for your use. So when you refer to D in square root, it refers to a particular sequence of bytes in the stack so-called activation mechanism. That place, you know, into 
replace some bar. Okay. Um, replace the square root. <coughs> okay. What happens when you place a variable but you don't assign a value? To it? Is there a value there anyway? Yes. There's a value there anyway. You think by putting that that there's no value? No. There's a value. You just have see you forfeited the opportunity, you've waived the right to put something there. You've forfeited the, the sort of chance to actually set it there. So always, ladies and gentlemen, in C, always initialize it. In some languages, it will detect this for you. So if you, this is one of the most common bugs. You have int x, and then you do what? You have x plus 1. You use the value of x. In some languages, it will detect that. <coughs> It'll say you've used an uninitialized variable. Go figure. That's great. But in C, what will happen? It won't say anything. It just uses what's there, which is luck of the draw, up to chance, up to, you know, you call bar. So foo calls bar. Bar has an int x. And if you didn't initialize it, it just takes on whatever value was there before. <laughs> it depends on what was called last by foo. Because, you know, there was some other stack record up here earlier. Maybe it had the value minus 2 there. And so now it takes on minus 2. Maybe that minus 2 was part of a floating point value. But now it just treats it as the value of x. Oh, man. So always initialize your variables. Always. This is not a language that's forgiving in that regard. Always initialize them. Initializing was something bad looking, so you'll recognize it. Oh, this is illegal value. Initialize it so that so that it's obvious it's a bad value. That's offensive program. Okay, so an array in memory. It's just it's a pointer to some to some memory. And you know, this is a two two byte thing. Maybe these are integers. Here's This is the name of the array, and this is the address of the zeroth element to the array. Hmm? Okay. Um, so addition and subtraction, we saw this earlier. I mean, roughly speaking, um, here we have you know, int of x of 4. If you say x plus 2, it's just like the address of the second element of x. That's not the second byte of x. These are ints, ints may be two bytes each. So this is the address of the second int entry of x, which may be four bytes in. Zero, number zero. Byte zero and one are for the first one. Byte two and three are for the second one. And it's uh, byte, byte four. for trouble. Get get rid of that out out black spot. Um so so let me let me oh man. Um I'm sorry I, I could have confused you. Uh maybe I already have. Um okay there we go. Uh so if we have in star x pointer equals x um could be some um so here we we're saying this is the pointer to the x-ray and we could assign add two to it and now it will be referring not to the beginning of the array. Here it was referring to the beginning of the array. x pointer equals x. 
But and let me let me put this in just so it's less less confusing. So here it's pointing at the beginning of the ray. If we do x p pointer equals two, it's not it's now pointing not to the zeroth element. So no, sorry, not to the element at index zero. It's not pointing to the element at index one. It's pointing to the element of index two. Yeah. Um, you can't do x plus equals two because this is the name of the array. You can't add something to it. Are people comfortable with that? People okay. Okay. Um, use the size of function. You saw this in some of your um, lab, uh, one of your labs at least. Um, size of what we're trying to size in bytes of a data type. So you can see size of n, size of char, size of float, size of double. Okay. Um, and and it turns out that you know we could determine these values by doing size of. And I think you saw this in one of your labs. And you know you could fill things in here. And it turns out C is not so specific about the meaning of, of these things. They're, they're context specific, they're operating system and platform specific. So a long end means something different in terms of the number of bytes on a 32 bit system versus a 64 bit system. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, can be cause for confusion. Um, it turns out that um, that there are built-in types that well, not built-in, excuse me. There are there are types that um, are defined for C that um, that have precise sizes. So if you want to say I want an eight-bit integer or a sixteen-bit integer or an eight-bit unsigned integer or a sixteen-bit unsigned integer or a thirty-two-bit regular signed integer or a thirty-two-bit unsigned integer. You can use it with these sort of types like that. And that will that gets away from this whole, you know, loosey goosey situation where you say a long int and it means different things on a 32 bit versus a 64 bit system. It lets you say I know exactly what the length of this is. I don't expect you to to uh, you know know what's defined for different lengths, but you should know that there are some things that are clearly defined that are universal meaning in C as to their size and then there are some things which vary by platform like these things. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens? That's a great question and I had that question actually in an office hour. What happens if we try to use a 64-bit int on a 32-bit system? So suppose we have one of these guys, and we try to do it on a 32-bit system. Well, suppose we try to add a 64-bit int. How many bytes is in a 64-bit int? Eight bytes. So it spans eight bytes. Suppose we, we had that, and um, and we wanted to First of all, we have to decide which is 
I have two bytes. You folks are in 215. Um, and you could be having to deal with this. Suppose I have two bytes. Well, suppose I have one byte. Let's, let's start simple. Suppose I have one byte, a single byte. What numbers can I represent for the single byte? Zero to 255. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to write them on binary, although I could do so. Great. Now suppose I want to represent a 256. <coughs> How would I do that? I want to represent the number 256 using two bytes. How would I do it?
I could do so with a call to malloc of size 20, 10 times 2. Or I could do so with calloc, telling it I want to allocate 10 things each of these values. That's, that's all there is. You can multiply it all the time. Okay, good question. Okay, other question. I'm just, I'm just so happy to be able to, to, to answer some questions. What I will say is this. This time it's been awfully focused. And I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm happy to do it. But it's been very, very focused on like the lower level stuff of what's going on. That's fine. But I think uh, it'd be nice to do another session, if possible, where I could try to answer questions on things like <coughs> regular expressions or subversion or, uh, or test-driven development or uh, use of uh, command line utilities in, or or use of DVD, that sort of stuff. Um, so sort of uh, higher level stuff. I, I understand that, that a lot of people do want to understand kind of at a mechanistic level what exactly is happening. And I do know that if you're working with C in particular, if you don't understand what's happening at the level of a function call, you're going to get yourself into trouble. However, there's a lot of other take on in the scores besides just low level stuff. Okay, and um, some things like software development principles, test driven development, use of subversion, use of utilities like could be seen, like said, um, uh, debugging. Um, uh, these are make files. These are actually things that probably for many of you will be closer to your experience than than sort of pointer arithmetic and so on. And so while I'm happy to, to do a session on this, I think for a future session, we'll see if we can concentrate on these higher level, higher level things. So we make sure we can cover all the bases before the final review, which, which will you know, be course wide. Okay, so thank you very much. And please do not go away with the impression that